it's a real pleasure to take part in this uh, webinar focused on advanced materials for transient uh, electronics. I'll spend the next 15 minutes talking about our own research in this uh, emerging uh, area of study with uh, kind of a focus on inorganic uh, materials as a complement to the kind of uh, organic materials that have been explored for transient electronics with a particular focus in biomedical applications, specifically temporary implants that go into the body, provide uh, a useful clinically relevant function for a finite time, and then gradually uh, disappear by natural processes of bioresorption. So the uh, presentation is uh, divided into three parts. I'll begin with a, a motivation and overall perspective, how we think about this area of material science and, and engineering research, provide a context, and then step you through some of the materials options, again, a focus on inorganic materials and, and ways to uh, combine those materials together to uh, uh, form the basis of devices that, that provide clinically useful function in monitoring and or stimulation and give a specific example of um, you know, particular targeted application that we're quite excited about uh, in this field of bioelectronic medicines where we're using electrical stimulation in particular to accelerate processes of neuroregeneration in a damaged peripheral nerve. So my home appointment is in material science and engineering, but as you'll see as I move through this presentation, we're very interested in the boundary between materials and uh, biomedical device technology. So um, our work may be more broadly, uh, you know, uh, fr framed in this space uh, involves um, you know, the development of advanced electronic materials for classes of um, you know, semiconductor device technologies that can intimately interface uh, with the soft, curved, time dynamic uh, surfaces of the body, um, biological tissues in, in general, but with uh, a real eye toward applications in, in human health. So brain interfaced uh, electronics for mapping and stimulating brain processes Similar classes of devices as cardiac interfaces would be another example. Skin uh, integrated systems uh, as well for continuous wireless tracking of physiological status uh, represent some of the various areas that, that, we're, uh, that we're interested in. Uh, one question uh, and a central question in uh, activities of, of, of those sorts is uh, what are the uh, foundational materials that, that you could consider for electronic or semiconductor device technologies that have those sort of biocompatible features, mechanical properties, uh, materials properties that are intrinsically uh, biocompatible. And uh, one way to think about it is in terms of advanced uh, semiconducting polymers that, that could be um, designed to offer the kinds of electronic functionality you'd ultimately need, but with the mechanical properties that support that capability for intimate biological interfaces. And there's uh, quite a bit of work uh, that's, that's happened in, in that direction over the last 10 or 20, 20 years, development of or organic active materials. And I think that's a very exciting area of research. But the theme of this presentation is going to be on opportunities for inorganic materials, uh, you know, for those same kinds of applications. And in particular, thinking about materials like silicon in um, functional forms that, that, that allow that bio interface, but but in classes of materials that are still well aligned with more conventional, rigid, planar uh, device technologies that you would see in consumer gadgetry, for example. And, and silicon turns out to be interesting, not in, in wafer format, where you're kind of constrained to that planar, rigid type of uh, physical uh, characteristics, but, but in the form of nanomaterials. So we like to think about silicon nanomembranes uh, due to their extreme mechanical flexibility, their low bending stiffness and their capacity for uh, use in heterogeneously integrated systems where you're combining inorganic and organic materials together. A, set, a, a collection of properties that follow very straightforwardly from fundamental considerations in uh, materials mechanics, in particular bending mechanics and, and adhesive uh, mechanics uh, where reductions in thickness uh, have all kinds of uh, benefits in terms of uh, mechanical bendability and, uh, and and adhesion ability to to join you know dissimilar materials together and um, these are the kinds of scaling relationships that one one thinks about uh, in that broader context and so that basic idea of uh, you know inorganic nanomaterials as building blocks for biointegrated electronics has a lot of um, 
merit, and, and we and others have been working in that direction uh, at an accelerated pace, I think, over the last uh, few years to, to develop advanced high-performance kinds of electronic devices that, that can support this uh, you know, vision for biointegration that I mentioned before. And we've done a lot in the brain and the heart, as I mentioned before, um, you know, the skin uh, as well. Uh, and this is a good transition point to think about, you know, this frontier area of transient electronics in this context. Because if you think about a brain interface or, or a, a cardiac interface uh, technology platform, you can think of them it's in sort of two regimes uh, defined by the times over which the devices are integrated with the biology. One kind of in the context of a surgical procedure as an advanced surgical tool or diagnostic platform where the interface may need to persist only for a few hours on one extreme. Uh, the other extreme would be as a chronic permanent implant, uh, like an advanced pacemaker, for example, where the lifetime would be defined by the life of the patient. So now you're talking about decades uh, uh, you know, in terms of uh, times. And we thought, you know, initially working in this area, that those were the two most relevant uh, timeframes for integration. But what we found is that there's a whole set of applications that, that would require integration for times in between those two limiting cases, in between a few hours and a few decades, where the, the integration may uh, be needed only for a few days or weeks or months, uh, where the function would be timed to a natural transient biological process, such as wound healing, where the functionality would be relevant as the wound is recovering, uh, but beyond that time, may, maybe the, the device function is no longer needed because, because the healing has been completed. So thinking about temporary diagnostic or therapeutic implants uh, opens up this whole concept of uh, you know, transient device technologies, where the material science challenge is in defining function that's relevant but in materials that ultimately degrade and disappear without a trace uh, in the body to eliminate what at that point would be unnecessary device load on the body and risk to the patient uh, for the device to persist beyond its useful lifetime. And so that uh, sort of defines then a, a new area of electronics, quite a bit different than traditional electronics, which are designed to, to last forever. Uh, electronics that are designed to last only for a finite time period. And, and we refer to that uh, class of technology as, as a transient electronic device. So it's an electronic system that fully or partly dissolves, resorbs, or otherwise physically disappears at a programmed rate or a triggered time engineered into the system at the material level. And so very uh, much centered on advanced concepts in, in material science. And you can think about, you know, different kinds of applications of this concept of transient electronics all the way from you know things that might be relevant in uh, you know defense systems hardware secure non-recoverable electronics reconfigurable electronics environmental monitors that you might need only in the field for a finite time period and after which they could just resorb and disappear into the uh, environment even just reducing electronic waste streams associated with consumer gadgetry might be an interesting you know, set of opportunities for this concept of transient electronics. But I'll really focus today on uh, what we, we think is, is a frontier area in, in temporary therapeutic or diagnostic implants. So biomedical uh, devices is, is where, where uh, you know, most of our activity is focused uh, these days. And so, you know, the, the fundamental question in material science is, is how are you going to build devices uh, that disappear into the body, resorb, dissolve essentially in biofluids. And um, you know, I think we were lucky to kind of stumble across the fact that uh, silicon itself is uh, water soluble. And uh, I think this is uh, uh, very poorly or you know, uh, uh, poor, poorly appreciated um, uh, fact uh, that is, is not really apparent when, when you're dealing with silicon in a wafer form where the thickness might be you know, a millimeter or a half millimeter. But, but if you're interested in these nanoscale forms of silicon, as I mentioned before, due to their uh, interesting mechanical properties, you quickly realize just through experimental studies that uh, silicon actually does dissolve in water at physiological conditions uh, at a very well controlled rate defined by surface erosion processes where the reaction is involving the hydrolysis of silicon to form silicic acid. 
at rates of a few nanometers per, per day in terms of change in thickness. And you can kind of see this in the uh, AFM images at the top of this slide. You plot out the heights of these uh, silicon nanomembranes and their thicknesses over time. And you can really see a, a very well controlled linear uh, dissolution kinetics associated with this uh, process. And so, so this was something we stumbled across because we were interested in silicon nanomembranes for flexible electronics. And, and it really, I think for us, opens up a, a clear materials-driven pathway to high-performance water-soluble uh, electronics for these temporary uh, implants. So that's kind of the, the, the chemistry, the basic um, you know, aspects of it. It turns out to be a much more complex uh, problem in the presence of electrolytes and proteins and enzymes and other species that one encounters in biofluids, but that's the very basic you know, chemistry that you're, you're uh, uh, operating around in terms of how silicon dissolves in aqueous environments. So that, that's one question on the material side. The other has to do with biocompatibility, like what happens to the silicon after it dissolves into silicic acid? How is it uh, eventually expelled from, from the body? And um, with, with the note that uh, silicic acid itself is a naturally occurring species uh, in biofluids, it's, it's an essential uh, element for life processes. So, so it's not a foreign type of compound, but, but there are dose limits and so on. And so we've done a lot of animal studies to uh, watch the time kinetics of how silicon is uh, expelled from the body after it uh, dissolves away from, from these transient electronic implants. And you see it basically uh, through natural excretion processes, uh, it's eliminated within, within a few weeks and you're back down to uh, normal physiological levels of silicon after the devices have dissolved. So it's an important set of, set of studies. The other thing to bear in mind here is that the total amounts of the silicon are very small, so microgram quantities, because all you need uh, you know, for electronic functions are very, very thin uh, films of silicon, these nan nanomaterials. So that's the idea. That's the base semiconductor material. That it turns out that there's a whole host of uh, dielectrics that you can think about, inorganic, water-soluble materials from silicon dioxide, silicon nitride, and so on. There's a whole host of metals that you can think about that are bioresorbable, also providing good conductivity and good uh, electrode characteristics for forming integrated circuits. And, and you can heterogeneously combine these inorganic materials with organics to build functional systems. And, th and that's what you can do. There's, there's a lot of uh, fundamental material science that, that needs to happen to understand how these materials sort of interact with uh, biofluids, and, and we've done a lot of those studies, others as well. It's an interesting set of, set of chemistries that, that are important, but ultimately you're kind of interested in, in engineering uh, devices. This is an example of a ring oscillator built with silicon nanomembranes and various other kinds of inorganic uh, electronic materials supported by uh, a biomaterial substrate, uh, silk fibroid. Uh, in, in particular. And this operates in the way that you would expect based on the circuit design characteristics, but it has this unique uh, defining feature that all of the constituent materials are uh, water soluble to biocompatible end products is, is kind of the, the goal here. And this is a movie just showing the uh, water induced dissolution of a platform like that. It's a, a coal pits oscillator designed to, to dissolve very rapidly in, uh, in environmental water, in this case, simulated uh, rainfall. So again, there are many different applications you can think about uh, in terms of uh, transient or bioresorbable implants, temporary implants that provide a electronic function relative, again, to a natural biological process and then sort of engineered to disappear shortly uh, thereafter to, to eliminate you know, that un unnecessary device load. I'll fo focus on one example. We've done a lot and others have as well in, in sensing platforms. And that's, uh, you know, that kind of represents an important uh, area of opportunity, but, but I think where, where the real frontier is in therapeutic delivery with these devices and ultimately combination of therapy with uh, sensing or monitoring function to allow kind of closed feedback loop control is, is where I think the field is, is quickly evolving. But let me focus on uh, therapeutic value in, a, in the context of a, a surgical procedure, and I'll sort of uh, obscure this for um, you know, the, the audience here who, who might not uh, you'll be comfortable lo looking at images of this sort. But, but I highlight this because it was an opportunity brought to us by neurosurgeons at Washington University's medical school. And uh, it turns out that uh, a common practice in the treatment of severely damaged uh, peripheral nerve involves a surgical procedure whereby the, uh, the patient is opened up, the 
damaged site is sutured uh, together, uh, followed by electrical stimulation uh, proximal to, to the damaged site, uh, because there's a lot of data that indicate that that kind of electrical stimulation can accelerate the rates of neuroregeneration and, and lead to better outcomes for, for the patient. That stimulation, though, is really limited only to the intraoperative period where you have a physical access to, to the nerve. And the concept uh, brought to us by the surgeons was uh, if you could build a bioresorbable, wirelessly controlled nerve stimulator, then you could continue that kind of stimulation beyond the intraoperative period in a dosed fashion spread out across the entire healing period. Uh, and that, that uh, would represent a new potentially new standard of care that would further improve the therapeutic benefits of electrical stimulation really confined again to that surgical period uh, currently. So this would be sort of con uh, a cartoon illustration of the vision. Produce a transient electronic stimulator, drop it into the patient at the tail end of the operation, leave it in there, activate it wirelessly to dose out this electrical uh, stimulation. And then you know, after the healing is, is completed, uh, the device would just disappear, uh, thereby eliminating the very difficult surgery that would be required to uh, you know, extract the device and, and remove it from that very fragile uh, nerve. So it turns out you can do all of that. I won't get into the details. It's a combination of the inorganic and organic material strategies to put together a platform that involves a, a cuff-based interface to the nerve uh, to deliver electrical stimulation. Uh, electrically uh, connected to a wireless coil that allows us to uh, wirelessly deliver power. Uh, that coil interfaces to uh, a rectifier system that consists of a silicon nanomembrane diode and a capacitor uh, to uh, smooth out the, the voltage uh, waveforms delivered by the AC uh, input uh, uh, power. So that, that's kind of the, the way it looks. This, this is uh, a picture of such a device just to give you a sense of the construction, the inner, inorganic uh, materials here are molybdenum uh, and silicon, uh, pri primarily a little bit of silicon dioxide, and the organic material is uh, PLGA, it's a, a biodegradable polymer, it's an encapsulation layer and a supporting substance. So these are some uh, examples of the, of the kinds of uh, results that we've been able to uh, obtain. This is electrical stimulation over a period of time showing the enhanced therapeutic benefit enabled by, you know, this bioresorbable stimulator and its activation over a period of days following the uh, surgical operation to repair uh, the damaged sciatic nerve. So, so this looks very promising, maybe a first example of a neuroregenerative, uh, neuroregenerative electronic medicine, in a sense, as a complement to what's possible with uh, pharmaceutical approaches. And uh, we were able to convince the uh, editors of Nature Medicine that it, this in, is, in fact, uh, a new type of uh, medicine, a new way to think about uh, medicine. So with that, I'll, I'll go ahead and conclude. I think this area of uh, transient electronics are very exciting. Bioresorbable as a subset of that broader uh, area is one that we're quite interested in. It really combines engineering science with clinical medicine in a way that we think is very interesting. And I want to acknowledge all the senior collaborators involved in the work. Uh, but the most important people are the students and the postdocs who actually uh, do the work. And uh, I'll just conclude my presentation with acknowledgement. Uh, to, to, that, to those folks and all of their good ideas and, and their hard work. So, so thank you again for your attention.